Well, we are back in the book of Genesis. If you recall, it was last February where we began studying through the book of Genesis. So it has it's been quite a long journey. Uh, we took some breaks here and there in the summer. We, we took a, a few weeks to study through the Psalms. We've been doing that every summer, picking up in the Psalms. And then once we got to December, we, we spent some time uh, looking at uh, the season of Advent and going through the birth of Christ. Uh, after we finished our looking at our, our ecclesiology, which we've been doing in the month of January, now we find ourselves back in Genesis. And uh, the plan is to, to finish this book out, I think, by June. We'll see. I make plans and then I get there and I'm like, oh, not done yet. So we'll see when we get there. But one thing that we were talking about during ecclesiology, during the doctrine of the church, is, is a safeguard that we can have as the church so we don't just hit that one note all the time, or we don't find our hobby horse uh, doctrine we like to talk about all the time, and that's it, is by going through God's Word sequentially and just allowing the text to dictate what we talk about and what we learn from God's Word. You know, that's why we have a book. And usually when you read a book, you just you start from the beginning and you work your way through it. Generally, in the Bible, we, we, we look at one verse here, we turn the page, we go here. And, and, and there's a time for that. But there's also wisdom in trying to allow God's story to unfold before our eyes. And that's what we've been doing. And, and one of the things that I haven't had a chance to get them up yet, but next week I'll have our banners up that, that Duper's been working on for us, is we've been trying to... I know you got to finish that last one. Get on it. We've been trying to keep the big picture together as we've been looking at God's word unfold because we want to understand what is the big picture that God is giving us in his word. Because we often know little bits here and there, but the question is, how do all these pieces fit together, right? Puzzles are a fun thing, but if you just throw out the box and you say, this puzzle is so great, and you never put it together to see the picture, that's a little bit strange, right? You, you want to know what the full picture is. You don't just enjoy little sections of cloud and little sections of something red. I don't know what that is, but it goes together. We want the whole picture to come together. And so one guide that we've been using as the overarching story of the Bible is, is creation, fall, redemption, new creation. We take these four phrases and we use them to keep our trajectory going. Creation. God creates the world out of nothing. Right? God has always been. And then some time in eternity passed before there was time. I'll try to figure that out. God says, let there be light. And there is light. And God begins to create. And after he creates, he looks at his creation and says, it is very good. It is what he wanted to do. God creates man in his likeness and his, his image. And he gives them the task of being the, the under kings of this world. He says, have dominion. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. He says, this is it. Be my image bearers in this world, which is a great task to be given by God. And then we come to Genesis 3 and the problem is sin enters into this picture and it corrupts that which was very good. However, God is not done, nor does this take God by surprise. Because in the midst of these punishments and curses that he brings upon creation because of sin, he gives us the first gospel message, the proto-euangelion, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And that's the first thing that we're looking for. Who's this seed going to be to bring redemption, to bring together the wholeness of this mess that we have? And the history of Israel, the history of what we call the Old Testament is all about that, of trying to find that promise fulfilled. And throughout, God makes other promises to clarify what he meant. And so God interacts with a man named Abraham. And God says to Abraham, it'll be through you, Abraham. You, I will be a blessing to you, and through you, you'll be a blessing to the whole world. And so through the study of Genesis, we've been seeing the outworking of God working through Abraham's family. And now we come to a very strange almost 
message. Strange chapter. In one chapter, we have this story that almost seems to sidetrack us. That almost goes, wait a second, we, we've kind of got off track here. Why are we talking about this? Where we want to see the story move forward. But I think once in a while, God wants us to give us a glimpse once again of what the fall does. Because we have too high a view of ourselves. We often forget about stuff that has already been talked about. We often forget that the fall in Genesis chapter 3 is a comprehensive fall. Even in every single one of our hearts. How bad was that that happened? It was bad. It was devastating. And it means that we can't do anything to make ourselves right with God. It means we need a mediator. We need God to step in and do something because we're drowning here by ourselves. And this is a great example of that. It's, again, I was reading this passage all week this week and it's, it's not the funnest stuff to focus upon. But the interesting thing, this is providence for you, right? God works in ways where he opens up our eyes to the world around us. Not only am I reading this in the Bible, but every morning when I get up and get my cup of coffee and sit down and I would say open the newspaper, but I open up my news app, right? I open up my news app and I read the headlines of that day. And what do I see every single morning? It's new celebrities or CEOs or politicians who are being accused of sexual abuse of one sort or another. This is what we're dealing with. This is what is making the news. Every single day we have these, what we think are titans of the industry. We think that they are the talking heads and they're the, the pop culture gurus of our day. And more and more they are falling because some dirt has been caught up with them and it is laid before them. And public opinion means a lot. So these people end up losing that status. The funny thing to me is when you read a lot of these news reports... Most people are shocked. They can't believe this. How could somebody do that? How could we live in a world where this stuff exists? It, it just goes way beyond them. They couldn't possibly imagine this. And yet you look at what these, these talking heads are in charge of creating out in this world. Why should it surprise us at all? This really started, well, at least to gain most of its ground, when the film producer Harvey Weinstein was, was brought forth. And there was a whole thing about him in the New York Times. And now he got a lot of uh, press in a bad way for that. And after that, actor, celebrity after another was falling because of it. That was uh, the beginning of October of last year that Harvey Weinstein story hit. Well, it was September, just the month before, at the very end of it, where Hugh Hefner died. And if you caught any news of that, you would have thought that the great American war hero of our time had died. There was like parades and balloons and everybody saying how wonderful this guy was. And man, he just, he's, he's a hero. We lost one of the greats. What did he create? What are, what are the ideal, ideas and ideologies that are behind that kind of thinking? And then we're surprised. We're surprised because we can't see that connection. That we live in a world that celebrates, that loves immorality. That loves to, to hate the things of God. And then when it works out in its natural ways, we are surprised and flabbergasted. It's a sad thing to talk about. It's a, incidents like these, it's sad to say, are a normal part of our fallen world. I, had, I was looking up some statistics this past week, if you caught the article this Wednesday, because I, I wanted to try to get that together. And one of the statistics was that one in four girls will be abused before they're 18 years old. That is scary to me. And it makes it, it should open up our eyes and see we live in a fallen world, don't we? This is what we've created. We've created this ourselves. And yet this is where we are. So reading these accounts of Dinah 
And this very thing happening to her is a very modern message that should go out. Reading about Dinah and her family should be something that we should say, if we think we're surprised by this, let me tell you, there's nothing new under the sun. Atrocities like these have been happening since the beginning. It's almost surprising when you do a Bible study on a topic like this, how many accounts you will find. I, I, I kind of know that they're in there, but I really didn't know until I took them all out and laid them side by side and read some of these accounts. We'll look at a cross-reference of one in a little bit that I don't want to read too much because it's horrible. It really is horrible. The sinfulness of our hearts is far more than we could possibly imagine. And the only reason each and every one of us does not live out every single evil thought that we ever possibly had is because it is the grace of God restraining you. That is why we do not destroy ourselves in this world right now is because God is restraining us. Praise God for that. I thank you, God, that you restrain me because I know the evil of my heart. But I need his grace to intercede for me. What do we know about Dinah? Well, Dinah is presumably the only daughter of Jacob. She's the only daughter listed. And it seems when you read it that she is the only one. She is the daughter of Leah. And what we know about Leah and Rachel and that whole incident that we talked about a few months ago is that Leah is the, the wife that is hated. Rachel is the wife that is loved. And that seems to come out in the relationship that Jacob has with his children that come from Leah. He almost seems to have more of a standoffish relationship with them. Remember, who are the children that he loves? He seems to love Joseph a lot, and we're going to get to that pretty soon. And he loves Benjamin, because those are the sons that came from Rachel, his beloved. And so he shows special attention to them, and, and uh, it seems like maybe he's a little bit away from his other children. In a minute, we're going to look at how he responds to this whole uh, event. Dinah at this time is probably around 13 years of age, anywhere from 13 to 16, 17, maybe. Um, time that passed between leaving with the incidents of Esau and then this happens before uh, the whole stuff with uh, Joseph being sold into Egypt. Remember, Joseph was sold into Egypt when he was about 17 years old and she needs to be at least a year younger than Joseph. So she's anywhere from 13 to 17 years old. So she is a very young girl. What goes on? Well, she decides that she wants to go out. Verse uh, two, uh, 1 in chapter 34. She wants to go out and she wants to see the women of the land. What exactly does that mean? We, we don't give a lot of information about this, but perhaps, you know, being a girl with all these brothers, you want to just to get some friends or something. You want to kind of move out and get to know what's going on out here. Depending on the different commentators that you read, they'll try to read into that different motives. But I say, honestly, we can't know exactly what that means. Now, there is some uh, lack of judgment on her part to do this. As, especially being an unmarried girl, the best thing for her to do would be if she's going to go out, she has to have escorts with her. Right, we're always seeing escorts taking people into new and foreign lands Jacob, though, is supposed to be protecting his family. He's supposed to be keeping them from the world around them that is going to infiltrate and ruin his family. Right? Over and over again, God is telling them, you need to stay away from the influences of the world. Because what can happen? We start to get a little bit in there. We start to become comfortable with it. And once we get uh, grabbed by the influences of the world, sometimes... End of story for us. It pulls us away from where God wants us to be. However, she does go into the land. And this is what one pastor called bold biblical realism. That it tells us what happened. And it is a difficult story, like I said. Not only do the events of Dinah seem difficult for us to, to read and to grab onto but also the response of those who are there. What happens to Dinah? Well, well, she goes into this land and Shechem, who is a prince of the land, sees her. 
So Dinah probably is a beautiful young girl. We've, we've seen instances of this with her grandmother, Sarah. And um, who's Isaac's wife again? Huh? Rebecca. Yay, thank you. Good. Remember we had those instances where Abraham is going into Egypt and he, the Pharaoh sees her and then Abimelech sees her and they, they have that whole thing. Well, it seems like we're following those same patterns. So this prince of this land sees her, desires her. But what does he do? Well, we see these words. There's three words that really show us how this is a violent event. It says he seized her. He grabbed her. He seized her. He lay with her and he humiliated her. Some of your translations may take those last two words, lay and humiliate, and kind of put them together. The New American Standard translates it, lay with her by force. Whatever it is, he took advantage of her. After he does this, he says, oh, I kind of like this girl. And we go, what is that about? And he becomes infatuated with her after he has humiliated her, after he has taken her by force. His evil heart got what it wants, and now he wants more. He wants to maybe try to make it better. I don't know, but he's going about this this way. Now, we have to recognize Dinah is not at fault for those circumstances. But at the same time, we have to recognize she should not have been there. Right? We have to, that's something we have to talk about with our children and our grandchildren is that sometimes location is important. Right? If, if we are trying to stay away from certain things in this world, certain influences, bad things can happen anywhere, yes, but there's a certain amount of wisdom that we must also have. We don't want to be where we know stuff is going to be happening or possibilities can arise. We must have wisdom in this world. Why? Because darkness pervades this world. We live in a world that has fallen. We live in a world that, that, that at all costs is going to try to destroy us. In 1 Peter, Peter describes Satan this way. He says he's like a roaring lion looking for someone to destroy now, if a lion is going to be hunting, you're not going to see him. Right? It's, it's not the lions that you see necessarily you have to be afraid of. It's the ones you don't see. Because the ones you don't see are the ones that are going to pounce. And that's the picture that we're given. He's a roaring liar, lion waiting to find someone to devour. The best we can do is at least not be in the savannah where he is or wherever he's going to be. Where should we be? We should be wherever the people of God are. We should use wisdom so we can try to stay away from places. It, it is sometimes more obvious to us than we might recognize that there is, are places in this world that we should stay away from. Especially when it comes to our children. We need to be careful where we let them go. We talked about this the other night, actually. Remember, there's the old commercial, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? It's an important question, right? I think today, instead of do you know where your children are, do you know what your children are watching? Do you know what they are getting from the internet, from social media? If we allow our children to just intake whatever and we don't, aren't aware of it, that's not good. What is entering into their minds? Are we aware of that? We need to be aware of it. There is darkness in this world. Dinah goes off into this place and she is abused. She is broken. She is taken advantage of. What are the responses? Well, like we said, Shechem becomes infatuated with Dinah. He then decides that he wants to marry her. So he says to his father, get me this girl to be my wife. Right? There are some things that have to be done, especially in this time, this culture. So he says, dad, let's do this. Get, get this girl for, for me to be my wife. How does Jacob respond? We'll get verse 5. 
It said, Jacob, now Jacob heard that his, that, let me say that again. Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were, in the, were with the livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. How does Jacob respond? He holds his peace. What? Why? What do you mean he holds his peace? Be a father. Wake up. Do something. There there are some things in this world that you you can't just sit by and be okay with and say, I'm going to figure out it later. No, we need to be proactive in who we are. We need to move forward. This is, this is not right. Some commentators say, oh, maybe he's, he's thinking about it, right? There's wisdom with, with people. No, you know what? Some things don't necessarily call for thinking. Sometimes you just got to do it. Jacob holds his peace. How does Simeon and Levi respond? Verse 7. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. Like these guys ran. They didn't wait. They didn't say, oh, we got to finish what we're doing. They came in from the field. And the men were indignant and very angry because they had done this outrageous thing. These guys are upset. They are livid. You just don't do this. And, but this is the thing. We need to be mad before stuff like this happens in our modern context. Let's not wait before something bad happens and then be angry. Let's be angry that the world that we live in allows this garbage to be around us all the time and we're okay with it. Now we can, do, we, we can allow it. Oh, it's all right. Because if, if we call it entertainment, if we can call it entertainment, then it's okay. <clears throat> Do you realize how, how desensitized we've become to some of the stuff that we watch for the sake of entertainment? This is, this is, this is hard for me, and it was hard for me, because as a guy, I, I love, you know I love films and stuff. I, 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 I love plays. I love all this stuff. But it comes to a point when I have to say, is it worth it to ruin my mind for the sake of entertainment? We need to be careful with this. Every single film you watch these days, and if it's a, a romantic comedy or whatever, what is it? It's, it's the people get together, they sleep together, they have all this on and off, and maybe at the end they'll get married. But if not, that's okay. Because that's the normal. Try it on before you buy it, Right? Why is that the world we live in? Why is that okay? Why, why do we think that's fine and we can deal with it? No, Simeon and Levi are angry. What do they do? Look at verse 13. They come up with a plan. Verse 13, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem, his father, Hamar, deceitfully. They start answering deceitfully. Why? Because he had defiled their sister, Dinah. So they make a plan. They say, you know what? You can come. You can marry our daughters. We'll marry your daughters. We can be a big happy family. But first, you know, we can't get together unless you are circumcised. Unless you can take the same sign of the covenant that we have taken. Because we're in relationship with God. So if you're going to come to us, you need to be in relationship with God as well. So do it. Go ahead. So what do they do? Shechem and Hamar, they go and they start, they go to the city gate, which is where all the business takes place, right? That's like the, the town hall. And they convince the people to do this. Talk about a hard bargain. They must be good salesmen. But they convince them to do it. The funny thing is, is when you read this account, they don't mention that we're doing this because Shechem likes that girl and he wants to have her as a bride. But they talk them into it. They do it as they're still healing from this. Simeon and Levi go in there and they destroy these people. They destroy all these men. They plunder. They take. Now, there is a part of me that goes, yeah, you get them. But in actuality, 
that was actually a very sinful thing for them to do as well. And that's something we have to remember. We haven't gotten to the law yet given by Moses in Exodus and Deuteronomy and issues yet, but there is still this idea of lex talionis. Lex talionis is eye for an eye. Right? It's the law that, it, that things have to be done within the same reason as they were taken. So if somebody steals your banana, you have to give them a banana back and maybe a little extra. But that doesn't mean you can take their car or something like that. Lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Right? We read that in the law. What do they do? They take matters into their own hands to such an extent they allow their anger, they allow their vengeance roll up inside of them, and they destroy all of these men in this city. Not only that, but then they plunder and they take every, all of their goods for themselves. Probably thinking, you know what? We deserve it. Because these are these people. They're so evil that they deserve this. So let's do this. In reality, that's not how we're supposed to go about it either. It matters the way we deal with things. It matters the way we deal with things. For us in our modern context, we need to remember that the gospel, the the message that Christ died to save sinners, that is our primary tool. We can get so caught up in other issues then we can miss that point. There's a, a group called AHA, Abolish Human Abortion. And they, we support desiring to abolish human abortion. Right? We think it's, it's murdering a child. It's, it's, it's evil. But these, this group has taken it to a, a, a part that is wrong. Where that becomes their be-all to end-all. Where they, that, that's what they want to do. They're going to go off. And if, if, if you are not doing exactly what they're doing, then you are sitting yourself. But the truth is that that's just a, um, a symptom of the bigger issue. The bigger issue is a heart issue. The reality is we need a heart change. And that comes from preaching the gospel. So we can't allow things to sidetrack us and to completely move us away from the gospel. There are things that we should do. Yeah, we should fight against abortion. Yeah, we we should fight against human trafficking and and, and, uh, sexual abuse. and, And we should fight against thieves and prostitutes and whatever it is. We can make the list. But we do that primarily by preaching the gospel. Otherwise, I'm correcting behavior. And I can correct your behavior. I can slap your hand if you do something wrong. But if your heart remains a heart of stone, a heart that has not been changed by God, then you can be the most moral person in the world. You will die. You will stand before a holy and just God. You'll have to give an account for your life. And all the morality in the world will not save you. We need God to save us. We need Christ to enter into this picture, to show us his amazing grace and to change our hearts. Simeon and Levi let their anger control them. And they came in. Who knows how many people were killed that day? I don't know. But it doesn't matter. Because whether these people worship the true God or not, they're still image bearers of God. Even through their sin. How does Dinah respond? Look at her words. You're not going to find them because they're not there. There's no words for Dinah in this. She doesn't respond as far as we can. We don't know what she said. We don't know how she feels. She, she doesn't explain it to us. In fact, Laura, I'm sure maybe if some of you ladies have read these books, I can't remember. I think it's, a, I can't remember the author. But Laura has these books that are, these fictional books, but they're based off of different Old Testament stories and different stories in the Bible. And one of the stories is, is from this, and the character girl, in it she is um, deaf. And so she can't, she can't speak either. She's deaf. And so and that's an interesting way to go about that story. But we don't have any words for Dinah. She doesn't try to proclaim her goodness or her innocence through this. 
We don't see her crying out. She just remains silent. But turn with me to Judges chapter 19. This is that account that I was telling you about that I don't want to read the whole thing. You can read it by yourself sometime. Judges chapter 19. If you know anything about the book of Judges, it is not the greatest time in the history of God's people. It is a very bad time in the history of God's people. Throughout this book, what, there's a refrain that goes throughout. It says, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It was a time where God's people would rather serve themselves than the true God. And this account in Judges 19 is a very straightforward example of that. Where a man is, has uh, another man and a concubine, his concubine staying at the house. Um, very familiar to what happens in Genesis with Lot. And when the crowds come and the angels are in his house, they ask them to come out so we may know them. And that's what happens here. But he doesn't send out the man. He sends out the concubine. And uh, in verse 25, it says, But the men would not listen, so the man seized his concubine and made, them, made her go out. And it says, And they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And this crowd of men abused this woman severely. Verse 27, And her master rose up in the morning, and when he had opened the door of the house and went out to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine laying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let us be going. But there was no answer. Now it's ambiguous. Is she alive or not? I don't know. He ends up picking her up and putting her on the donkey and they go away. But he says, get up, let's go. She doesn't answer. She has no words. Sometimes when something like that happens to somebody, it is difficult to form words. And the sad thing is that this happens to people. This happens to ladies all the time, and they don't even want to talk about it with anybody. It's something that so breaks them, and the shame and the fear that fills them. And I believe that there are many ladies who are dying on the inside because they are so disgusted of what has happened. And if anything, as the church, we need to be people that can reach out to those people who have been hurt so severely. We need to say that Christ can even heal this. And it's hard to believe that at times, and there's not a, a quick answer that we can say to somebody, but the love of Christ, His sacrifice for us, can even heal this. With the idea of maybe I did something to deserve this. What did I do to cause this? If you've been reading the book of Hebrews through our church Bible reading plan, we read in chapter 9 just a few days ago that through the blood of Christ, He even cleans and clears our conscience. So there are much things that might ruin us and tear us up on the inside, but, but Christ died on the cross so that I can be forgiven, that I know that this is not the end, that everything will be made new, that we will be with God forever in a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. There is no tears there. There is no worry there. There is wholeness. There is completion. And that this might hurt right now. Maybe you went through something like this and, and maybe that hurts. There's no band-aid that, that I can put on it. But I can say trust in Christ. Trust in what He has done. Because there is healing, but it does not come from anything of this world. It has to come from what He has done. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. This fall, it, in, it inflicts everything. It ruins everything. But God has come to make all things new. Through this, there is an abuse of the holy. And what I mean by that is, that's what we do in sin. We take something that is good and holy and we abuse it. Simeon and Levi abuse the covenant sign of God. They take something that is good in order to show a separation between God's people and the world. And they use it to murder. 
That is an abuse of the holy. Something that is supposed to be good. And we take it for evil. That's always what sin is. Taking something that God has given to us as a gift and ruining it. Relationships and sexuality is a good gift from God. And we take it in the world and we defile it. We ruin it. We turn it upside down. We almost do, if, in a sense, what Dinah has had here experienced. Is we think we get into relationships. We have the, 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 relation, the relations that a man and wife are supposed to have. We think that is what we can do. We'll get to the marriage stuff later, if at all. We have ruined it. We don't even know what love is anymore because we think love is seeing somebody who might be attractive to us. And we think that's love. Desiring that person. When that is so fickle and it disappears the next day. That is not love. That is lust. We abuse the holy when we don't look to God to see what this world is supposed to be. The question is, is there any hope? Read with me chapter 34 back in Genesis. The last two verses, verse 30 and verse 31. It said, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves together against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? And that's the end of that account. It ends on such a down note. right? It, it, it's, it's, like, it's like Star Wars. It's like uh, The Empire Strikes Back. Remember that one? The second one in the original trilogy? That movie doesn't end very well either, right? The, the Han Solo is frozen in the, the metal stuff. Luke gets his arm cut off and thrown down a thing. And you're like, wow, that's a happy ending. But those are the kind of endings we see in life sometimes. Maybe we feel like, what's our happy ending? Jonah ends that way too. Right? If you ever read the book of Jonah and, and you get past the, the whole, you know, getting swallowed by the fish thing, which was mostly what we f- f- find out when we think about Jonah. But the end is Jonah complaining. Jonah complaining, sitting under this tree, saying, God, why'd you do this? It ends on such a down note. And this is how it ends. Is there any hope then? Are God's people lost? Are we just lost in this world? Should we just give up? We're left hurting, and we're left by ourselves. What next? Chapter 35 of Genesis, just the first verse. After this whole event, after all this stuff has happened, listen what God says to Jacob. Verse 35, I'm sorry, chapter, one, blah, 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 chapter 35, verse 1. God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. And that's it. Just stop there. All of that has just happened. People feeling helpless. Anger has gotten the best of us. Dinah is, we don't know where, with a broken heart. Feeling unclean now. But God says, get out of here. Get out of here. And go to Bethel. And we remember what Bethel is and what it even means. Beit El, house of God. Go to the house of God and stay there. That's what we're calling for again. We can be lost in this world. We can be so broken and overcome by all the sin that we commit and that comes upon us and desires to ruin us and kill us. So what do we do? Get out of it. Go to the house of God and dwell there. Trust in Christ. This God that enters into his own creation to save us from this broken creation. Go to him. Trust in him. Stop trusting yourself. Stop thinking that you can be good enough or you can pick yourself up. You can dust yourself off and I'm going to do it. I'm going to go forward all by myself because I'm so smart. I'm so strong. I'm so wise. No, stop. 
Go to the house of God. Trust in Him. Trust that He's given us His Word. And His Word is true. His Word is pure. And I can believe it. Trust that grace is sufficient. That there's nothing that I can do to earn anything from God. But I trust in God's amazing grace. Go to the house of God. To close this, I just want to read for you the 23rd Psalm. And as I read it, I really want you to listen to these words and meditate upon what God has given us. Hear God's word. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Lord, that is what we want. We want to dwell with you. We want to dwell in your presence. We want to know your amazing grace. We are so lost at times. We can feel so broken. We can feel so dirty. But we know that you are there. That you do not leave us.